Hey, babe. Um, can't remember exactly how far into chapter 6 we got, so I'm just going to start at the beginning of chapter 6. I'd forgotten how many times a young man can get an erection, too. Don't take this the wrong way, Jesse said, lying on top of me after the third time. But I'm really not all that attracted to you. Thank God, I said. If you were, I'd be worn down to a nub by now. Don't get me wrong, Jesse said. I'm fond of you. Even before the... She motioned with her hand here, trying to think of a way to describe a rejuvenating full-body transplant. The change. You were intelligent and kind and funny. A good friend. Uh-huh, I said. You know, Jesse, usually the let's be friends speech is to prevent sex. I just don't want you to have illusions about what this is about. I was under the impression that it was about magically being transported into a body of a twenty-year-old and being so excited about it that it was imperative to have wild sex with the very first person we saw. Jesse stared at me for a second and then burst out laughing. Yes, that's exactly it. Although in my case it was the second person. I have a roommate, you know. Yeah? How does Maggie clean up? Oh my god, Jesse said. She makes me look like a beached whale, John. I ran my hands over her sides. That's a mighty fine beached whale, Jesse. I know, Jesse said and suddenly sat up, straddling me. She raised her arms up and crossed them behind her head, perking up her already marvelously firm and full breasts. I felt her inner thighs radiating heat as they wrapped around my midsection. I knew that even though I didn't have an erection at that very moment, one was coming right up. I mean, look at me, she said unnecessarily, because I hadn't taken my eyes off her from the moment she sat up. I look fabulous. I don't say that to be vain. It's just I never looked this good in real life, not even close. I find that hard to believe, I said. She grabbed her breasts and pointed the nipples at my face. See these, she said, and wiggled the left one. In real life, this one was a cup size smaller than this one, and it was still too large. I had a permanent backache from puberty onward, and I think they were this firm for one week when I was 13, maybe. She reached down, grabbed my hands, and placed them on her perfect flat belly. I never had one of these either, she said. I always carried a little pouch down here, even before I had babies. After two kids, well, let's just say that if I had ever wanted a third, it would have had a duplex in there. I slid my hands behind her and grabbed her ass. What about this? I said. Wide load, Jesse said and laughed. I was a big girl, my friend. Being big's not a crime, I said. Kathy was on the larger side. I liked it just fine. I didn't have a problem with it at the time, she said. Body issues are foolish. On the other hand, I wouldn't trade now. She ran her hands over her body provocatively. I'm all sexy. And with that, she did a little giggle and a head flip. I laughed. Jessie leaned forward and peered into my face. I'm finding this cat's eye thing incredibly fascinating, she said. I wonder if they actually used cat DNA to make them. You know, spliced cat DNA with ours. I wouldn't mind being part cat. I don't think it's really cat DNA, I said. We're not exhibiting other cat-like attributes. Jessie sat back up. Like what? She said. Well, I said, and let my hands wander up to her breasts. For one thing, male cats have barbs on their penis. <clears throat> Get out, Jessie said. No, it's true, I said. It's the barbs that stimulate the female to ovulate. Look it up. Anyway, no barbs down there. I think you'd have noticed if there were. That doesn't prove anything. Jessie said, and suddenly sent her back part back and her forward part forward to lie directly on top of me. She grinned salaciously. It could be that we just haven't been doing it hard enough to make them pop out. I'm sensing a challenge, I said. I'm sensing something too, she said and wriggled. What are you thinking about? Jessie asked me later. I'm thinking about Kathy, 
I said, and how often we lie around like we're doing now. You mean on the carpet, Jesse said, smiling. I bopped her gently on the head. Not that part. Just lying around after sex, talking and enjoying each other's company. We were doing this the first time we talked about enlisting. Why did you bring it up? Jesse said. I didn't, I said. Kathy did. It was on my 60th birthday, and I was depressed about getting older. So she suggested that we sign up when the time came. I was a little surprised. We'd always been anti-military. We protested the subcontinental war, you know, when it wasn't exactly popular to do that. Lots of people protested that war, Jesse said. Yeah, but we really protested. It became a little bit of a joke about it in town, actually. So how did she rationalize signing up with the Colonial Army? She said she wasn't against war or the military in a general sense, just that war and our military. She said that people have the right to defend themselves and that it was probably a nasty universe out there. And she said that beyond those noble reasons, we'd be young again to boot. But you wouldn't be able to enlist together, Jesse said, unless you were the same age. She was a year younger than me, I said. And I did mention that to her. I said that if I joined the army, I'd be officially dead. We wouldn't be married anymore, and who knows if we'd ever see each other again. What did she say? She said these were technicalities. She'd find me again and drag me to the altar like she had before. And she would have, you know. She could be a bear about these things. Jessie propped herself up on her elbow and looked at me. I'm sorry she's not here with you, John. I smiled. It's all right, I said. I just miss my wife from time to time, that's all. I understand, Jessie said. I miss my husband, too. I glanced over to her. I thought he left you for a younger woman and then got food poisoning. He did, and he did, and he deserved to vomit his guts out, Jessie said. I don't miss the man, really, but I miss having a husband. It's nice to have someone you know you're supposed to be with. It's nice to be married. It's nice to be married, I agreed. Jesse snuggled up to me and draped an arm over my chest. Of course, this is nice, too. It's been a while since I've done this. Lie on a floor? It was her turn to bop me. No. Well, yes, actually, but more specifically, lie around after sex. Or have sex, for that matter. You don't want to know how long it's been since I've had it. Sure I do. Bastard. Eight years. No wonder you jumped me the minute you saw me, I said. You got that right, Jesse said. You happen to be very conveniently located. Location is everything. That's what my mother always told me. You had a strange mother, Jesse said. Yo, bitch, what time is it? What? I said. I'm talking to the voice in my head, she said. Nice name you have for it, I said. What did you name yours? Asshole. Jesse nodded. Sounds about right. Well, the bitch tells me it's just after 1600. We have two hours until dinner. You know what that means? I don't know. I think four times is my limit, even when I'm young and super improved. Calm yourself. It means we have just enough time for a nap. Should I grab the blanket? Don't be silly. Just because I had sex on the carpet doesn't mean I want to sleep on it. You've got an extra bunk. I'm going to use it. So I'm going to have to nap alone? I'll make it up to you, Jessie said. Remind me when I wake up. I did. She did. God damn it, Thomas said as he sat down at the table, carrying a tray so piled with food that it was a miracle he could even lift it. Aren't we all just too good looking for words? He was right. The old farts had cleaned up amazingly well. Thomas and Harry and Alan could all have been male models. Of the four of us, I was definitely the ugly duckling, and I looked... Well, I looked good. As for the women, Jessie was stunning, Susan was even more so, and Maggie frankly looked like a goddess. It actually hurt to look at her. It hurt to look at all of us, in that good, dizzying sort of way. We all spent a few minutes just staring at each other. And it wasn't just us. 
As I scanned through the room, I couldn't find a single ugly human in it. It was pleasingly disturbing. It's impossible, Harry said suddenly to me. I looked over at him. I looked around, too, he said. There's no way in hell all the people in this room all looked as good as they do now when they were originally this age. Speak for yourself, Harry, Thomas said. If anything, I do believe I am a shade less attractive than in my salad days. You're the same color as a salad these days, Harry said. And even if we excuse doubtful Thomas over here, I'm going to cry all the way to a mirror, Thomas said. It's well nigh impossible that everyone is in the same basket. I guarantee you I did not look this good when I was 20. I was fat. I had massive acne. I was already balding. Stop it, Susan said. I'm getting aroused. And I'm trying to eat, said Thomas. I can laugh about it now because I look like this, Harry said, running his hand down his body as if to present this year's model. But the new me has very little to do with the old me, I'll tell you that. You sound as if it bothers you, Alan said. It does a little, Harry admitted. I mean, I'll take it. But when someone gives me a gift horse, I look it in the mouth. Why are we so good looking? Good genes, Alan said. Sure, Harry said, but whose? Ours? Or something that they spliced out of a lab somewhere? We're just all in excellent shape now, Jesse said. I was telling John that this body is in far better shape than my real one ever was. Maggie suddenly spoke up. I say that too, she said. I say my real body when I mean my old body. It's as if this body isn't real to me yet. It's real enough, sister, Susan said. You still have to pee with it. I know. This from the woman who criticized me for oversharing, Thomas said. My point, because I did have one, Jesse said, is that while they were toning up our bodies, they took some time to tone up the rest of us as well. Agreed, Harry said, but that's not telling us why they did it. It's so we bond, Maggie said. Everyone stared. Well, look who's coming out of her shell. Fight me, Susan, Maggie said. Susan grinned. Look, it's basic human psychology that we're inclined to like people who we find attractive. Moreover, everyone in this room, even us, are basically strangers to each other, and have few, if any, ties to bring us together in a short time. Making us all look good to each other is a way to promote bonding. Or will be, once we start training. I don't see how it's going to help the army if we're all too busy ogling each other to fight, Thomas said. It's not about that, Maggie said. Sexual attraction is just a side issue here. It's a matter of quickly instilling trust and devotion. People instinctively trust and want to help people they find attractive, regardless of sexual desire. It's why newscasters are always attractive. It's why attractive people don't have to work as hard in school. But we're all attractive now, I said. In the land of the incredibly attractive, the merely good-looking could be in trouble. And even now, some of us look better than others, Thomas said. Every time I look at Maggie, I feel like the oxygen is being sucked from the room. No offense, Maggie. None taken, Maggie said. The baseline here isn't each other as we are now, anyway. It's how we all appeared before. In the short term, that's reflexively the baseline we'll use. And a short-term advantage is all they'd be looking for anyway. So you're saying that you don't feel oxygen-deprived when you look at me, Susan said to Thomas. It's not meant to be an insult. Thomas said. I'll remember that when I'm strangling you, Susan said, speaking of oxygen deprived. Stop flirting, you two, Alan said, and turned his attention to Maggie. I think you're right about the attraction thing, but I think you're forgetting the one person we're supposed to be the most attracted to, ourselves. For better or worse, these bodies we're in are still alien to us. I mean, between the fact that I'm green and I've got a computer named Dipshit in my head... He stopped and looked at us all. What did you all name your brain pals? Asshole, I said. Bitch, Jesse said. Dickwad, said Thomas. Fuckhead, said Harry. Satan, said Maggie. Sweetie, said Susan. Apparently I'm the only one who likes my brain pal. Or like you were the only one who wasn't disturbed by having a voice suddenly appear in your skull, Alan said. But this is my point. Suddenly becoming young and having massive physical and mechanical changes takes a toll on one's psyche, even if we're glad to be young again, and I know I am. 
we're still going to be alienated from our new selves. Making us look good to ourselves is one way to help us get settled in. These are crafty people we're dealing with, Harry said with ominous finality. Oh, lighten up, Harry, Jesse said, and gave him a little nudge. You're the only person I know who would turn being young and sexy into a dark conspiracy. You think I'm sexy? Harry said. You're dreamy, sweetheart, Jesse said, and batted her eyes dramatically at him. Harry cracked a goofy grin. That's the first time this century anyone said that to me. Okay, I'm sold. The man who stood in front of the theater full of recruits was a battle-tested veteran. Our brain pals informed us that he'd been in the Colonial Defense Forces for 14 years and had participated in several battles, the names of which meant nothing to us now, but no doubt would at some point in the future. This man had gone to new places, met new races, and exterminated them on sight. He looked all of 23 years old. Good evening, recruits, he began after we had all settled down. I am Lieutenant Colonel Brian Hickey, and for the remainder of your journey I will be your commanding officer. As a practical matter, this means very little. Between now and our arrival at Beta Pixis Three, one week from now, you will have only one command objective. However, it will serve to remind you that from this point forward you are subject to Colonial Defense Forces rules and regulations. You have your new bodies now, and with those new bodies will come new responsibilities. You may be wondering about your new bodies, as to what they can do, what stresses they can endure, and how you can use them in the service of the Colonial Defense Forces. All these questions will be answered soon, as you begin your training on Beta Pixis III. Right now, however, our main goal is simply for you to become comfortable in your new skins. And so, for the remainder of your trip, here are your orders. Have fun. That brought up a murmur and some scattered laughter in the ranks. The idea of having fun being an order was amusingly counterintuitive. Lieutenant Colonel Higgy showed a mirthless grin. I understand this appears to be an unusual order. <coughs> be that as it may, having fun with your new body is going to be the best way for you to get used to the new abilities you have. When you begin your training, top performance will be required of you from the very start. There will be no ramp up. There is no time for that. The universe is a dangerous place. Your training will be short and difficult. We can't afford to have you uncomfortable with your body. Recruits, consider this next week as a bridge between your old lives and your new ones. In this time, which you will ultimately find all too brief, you can use these new bodies, designed for military use, to enjoy the pleasures you enjoyed as a civilian. You'll find the Henry Hudson is filled with recreations and activities you've loved on Earth. Use them. Enjoy them. Get used to working with your new bodies. Learn a little about their potential and see if you can divine their limits. Ladies and gentlemen, we will meet again for a final briefing before you begin your training. Until then, have fun. I do not exaggerate when I say that while life in the Colonial Defense Forces has its rewards, this may be the last time you will be entirely carefree in your new bodies. I suggest you use this time wisely. I suggest you have fun. That is all. You're dismissed. We all went insane. Let's start, of course, with the sex. Everyone was doing it with everybody else, in more places on the ship than it is probably sensible to discuss. After the first day, in which it became clear that any semi-secluded place was going to be used for enthusiastic humping, it became courteous to make a lot of noise as one moved about, to alert the conjugal that you were on your way in. Sometime during the second day, it became general knowledge that I had a room to myself. I was besieged with pleas for access. They were summarily denied. I'd never operated a house of ill repute. I wasn't about to start now. The only people who were going to fuck around in my room were me and any invited guests. There was only one of those. And it wasn't Jesse. It was Maggie, who, as it turned out, had had a thing for me even when I was wrinkled. After our briefing with Higgy, she more or less ambushed me at my door, which made me wonder if this was somehow standard operating procedure for post-change women. Regardless, she was great fun, and in private at least, not in the least retiring. It turned out that she had been a professor at Oberlin College. 
She taught philosophy of Eastern religions. She wrote six books on the subject. The things you learn about people. The other old farts also stuck to their own. Jesse paired up with Harry after our initial fling, while Alan, Tom, and Susan worked out some arrangement with Tom in the center. It was good that Tom liked to eat a lot. He needed his strength. The ferocity at which the recruits went for sex undoubtedly appears unseemly from the outside, but it made perfect sense from where we stood, or lay, or were bent over upon. Take a group of people who generally have had little sex, due to lack of partners or declining hell from libido, stuff them into brand new, young, attractive, and highly functional bodies, and then hurl them into space far away from anything they ever knew and everyone they ever loved. The combination of the three was a recipe for sex. We did it because we could, and because it beats being lonely. It's not the only thing we did, of course. Using these gorgeous new bodies only for sex would be like singing only one note. Our bodies were claimed to be new and improved, and we found it to be true in simple and surprising ways. Harry and I had to call off a ping-pong game when it became clear neither of us was going to win. Not because we were both incompetent, but because our reflexes and hand-eye coordination made it damn near impossible to get the ball past the other guy. We volleyed for 30 minutes and would have gone longer if the ping-pong ball we were using hadn't cracked from the force of being hit at such tremendously high speeds. It was ridiculous. It was marvelous. Other recruits found out the same thing we did in other ways. On the third day, I was in a crowd that watched two recruits engage in what was possibly the most thrilling martial arts battle ever. They did things with their bodies that simply shouldn't have been possible, assuming normal human flexibility and standard gravity. At one point, one of the men placed a kick that launched the other halfway across the room. Instead of collapsing in a pile of broken bones, as I'm sure I would have, the other guy did a backflip mid-flight, righted himself, and launched himself back at his opponent. It looked like a special effect. In a way, it was. After the battle, both men breathed deeply and bowed to his opponent, and then both of them collapsed onto each other, simultaneously laughing and sobbing hysterically. It's a weird, wonderful, and yet troubling thing to be as good at something as you ever wanted to be, and then to be even better than that. People went too far, of course. I personally saw one recruit leap off a high landing, either under the assumption that she could fly, or, barring that, at least land without injury. My understanding is that she shattered her right leg, right arm, jaw, and cracked her skull. However, she was still alive after the leap, a state of affairs that probably wouldn't have existed back on Earth. More impressively, however, she was back in action in two days, which obviously spoke more to the colonial medical technology than this silly woman's recuperative powers. I hope someone told her not to do such a stupid move in the future. When people weren't playing with their bodies, they were playing with their minds, or with their brain pals, which was close enough. As I would walk about the ship, I would frequently see recruits simply sitting around, eyes closed, slowly nodding their heads. They were listening to music, or watching a movie, or something similar, the piece of work called up in their brain for them alone. I'd done it myself. While searching the ship's system, I had come across a compilation of every Looney Tunes cartoon created both during their classic Warner days and then after the characters were put into the public domain. I spent hours one night watching Wile E. Coyote get smashed and blown up. I finally stopped when Maggie demanded I choose between her and Roadrunner. I chose her. I could pick Roadrunner any time, after all. I had downloaded all the cartoons into Asshole. Choosing friends was something I did a lot of. All of the old farts knew that our group was temporary at best. We were simply seven people thrown together at random, in a situation that had no hope for permanence. But we became friends, and close friends at that, in the short period of time we had together. It's no exaggeration to say that I became as close to Thomas, Susan, Alan, Harry, Jesse, and Maggie as I had to anyone in the last half of my normal life. We became a band, and a family, down to the petty digs and squabbles. We gave one another someone to care about, which was something we needed in a universe that didn't know or care that we existed. We bonded, 
and we did it even before we were biologically prodded to do so by the colony's scientists. And as the Henry, as the Henry Hudson drew closer to our final destination, I knew I was going to miss them. In this room right now are 1,022 recruits, Lieutenant Colonel Higgy said. Two years from today, 400 of you will be dead. Higgy stood in the front of the theater again. This time he had a backdrop. Beta Pixis III floated behind him, a massive marble streaked with blue, white, green, and brown. We were all ignoring it and focusing on Lieutenant Colonel Higgy. His statistic had gotten everyone's attention, a feat considering the time, 0600 hours, and the fact that most of us were still staggering from the last night of freedom we assumed we would have. In the third year, he continued, another hundred of you will die, another hundred and fifty in years four and five. After ten years, and yes, recruits, you will most likely be required to serve a full ten years. 750 of you will have been killed in the line of duty, three-quarters of you gone. These have been the survival statistics, not just for the last 10 or 20 years, but for the over 200 years the Colonial Defense Forces have been active. There was dead silence. I know what you're thinking right now, because I was thinking it when I was in your place, Lieutenant Colonel Higgy said. You're thinking, what the hell am I doing here? This guy is telling me I'm going to be dead in ten years. But remember that back home you most likely would have been dead in ten years too, frail and old, dying a useless death. You may die in the Colonial Defense Forces. You probably will die in the Colonial Defense Forces. But your death will not be a useless one. You'll have died to keep humanity alive in our universe. The screen behind Higgy blanked out to be replaced with a three-dimensional star field. Let me explain our position, he said, and as he did, several dozen of the stars burned bright green, randomly distributed across the field. Here are the systems where humans have colonized, gained a foothold in the galaxy, and these are where alien races of comparable technology and survival requirements are known to exist. This time hundreds of stars blazed up redly. The human points of light were utterly surrounded. Gasps were heard in the theater. Humanity has two problems, Lieutenant Colonel Higgy said. The first is that it is in a race with other sentient and similar species to colonize. Colonization is the key to our race's survival. It's as simple as that. We must colonize or be closed off and contained by other races. This competition is fierce. Humanity has few allies among the sentient races. Very few races are allies with anyone, a situation that existed long before humanity stepped into the stars. Whatever your feelings about the possibility for diplomacy in the long run, the reality is that on the ground we are in fierce and furious competition. We cannot hold back our expansion and hope that we can achieve a peaceful solution that allows for colonization by all races. To do so would be to condemn humanity. So we fight to colonize. Our second problem is that when we do find planets suitable for colonization, they are often inhabited by intelligent life. When we can, we live with native populations and work to achieve harmony. Unfortunately, much of the time we are not welcome. It is regrettable when this happens, but the needs of humanity are and must be our priority and so the Civil Defense Forces become an invading force. The background switched back to Beta Pixis III. In a perfect universe, we would not need the Colonial Defense Forces, Higgy said, but this is not that perfect universe. And so the Colonial Defense Forces have three mandates. The first is to protect existing human colonies and protect them from attack and invasion. The second is to locate new planets suitable for colonization and hold them against predation, colonization, and invasion from competing races. The third is to prepare planets with native populations for human colonization. As Colonial Defense Forces soldiers, you will be required to uphold all three mandates. This is not easy work, nor is it simple work, nor is it clean work, in any number of ways 
but it must be done. The survival of humanity demands it, and we will demand it of you. Three quarters of you will die in ten years. Despite improvements to soldiers' bodies, weapons, and technology, this is a constant. But in your wake, you leave the universe as a place where your children, their children, and all the children of humanity can grow and thrive. It's a high cost, and one worth paying. Some of you may wonder what you'll get personally from your service. What you'll get, after your term of service, is another new life. You will be able to colonize and to start again, on a new world. The Colonial Defense Forces will back your claim and provide you with everything you'll need. We can't promise you success in your new life, that's up to you. But you'll have an excellent start and you'll have the gratitude of your fellow colonists for your time of service to them and theirs. Or you can do as I have and re-enlist. You might be surprised at how many do. Beta Pixis III flickered momentarily and then disappeared, leaving Higgy as the sole focus of attention. I hope you all took my advice to have fun in this last week, he said. Now your work begins. In one hour, you will be transported off to Henry Hudson to begin your training. There are several training bases here. Your assignments are being transmitted to your brain pals. You may return to your rooms to pack your personal belongings. Don't bother with clothing. It will be provided on base. Your brain pal will inform you where to assemble for transport. Good luck, recruits. May God protect you, and may you serve humanity with distinction and with pride. And then Lieutenant Colonel Higgy saluted us. I didn't know what to do. Neither did anyone else. You have your orders, Lieutenant Colonel Higgy said. You are dismissed. The seven of us stood together, crowding around the seats in which we just sat. They certainly don't leave much time for goodbyes, Jesse said. Check your computers, Harry said. Maybe some of us are going to the same bases. We checked. Harry and Susan were reporting to Alpha Base, Jesse to Beta, Maggie and Thomas were Gamma, Alan and I were Delta. You're breaking up the old farts, Thomas said. Don't get all misty, Susan said. You knew it was coming. I'll get misty if I want, Thomas said. I don't know anyone else. I'll even miss you, you old bag. We're forgetting something, Harry said. We may not be together, but we can still keep in touch. We have our brain pals. All we have to do is create a mailbox for each other. The old farts clubhouse. That works here, Jesse said, but I don't know about when we're in active duty. We could be on the other side of the galaxy from each other. The ships still communicate with each other through Phoenix, Alan said. Each ship has skip drones that go to Phoenix to pick up orders and to communicate ship status. They carry mail, too. It might take a while for our news to reach each other, but it'll still reach us. Like sending messages in bottles, Maggie said. Bottles with superior firepower. Let's do it, Harry said. Let's be our own little family. Let's look out for each other, no matter where we are. Now you're getting misty, too, Susan said. I'm not worried about missing you, Susan, Harry said. I'm taking you with me. It's the rest of these guys I'll miss. A pact, then, I said, to stay the old farts through thick and thin. Look out, universe. I held out my hand. One by one, each of the old farts put their hand on mine. Christ, Susan said as she put her hand on the pile. Now I'm misty. It'll pass, Alan said. Susan hit him lightly with her other hand. We stayed that way as long as we could. Part 2 Chapter 7 On a far plain on Beta Pixis 3, Beta Pixis, the local sun, was just beginning its eastward journey up the sky. The composition of the atmosphere gave the sky an aqua tint, greener than Earth's but still nominally blue. On the rolling plain, grasses waved purple and orange in the morning breeze. Bird-like animals with two sets of wings could be seen playing the sky, testing out the currents and eddies with wild, chaotic swoops and dives. This was our first morning on a new world, the first I or any of my former shipmates had ever set upon. 
It was beautiful. If there hadn't been a large, angry master sergeant on it bellowing in my ear, it would have been just about perfect. Alas, there was. Christ on a popsicle stick, Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz declared after he had glared at the sixty of us in his recruit platoon. Standing, we hoped, more or less of attention on the tarmac of Delta Base's shuttle port. We have clearly just lost the battle for the goddamn universe. I look at you people and the words tremendously fucked leap right out of my goddamn skull. If you're the best that the Earth has got to offer, it's time we bend over and get a tentacle right up the ass. This got an involuntary chuckle from several recruits. Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz could have come from central casting. He was exactly what you expected from a drill instructor. Large, angry, and colorfully abusive right from the get-go. No doubt in the next few seconds he would get into one of the amused recruits' faces, hurl obscenities, and demand a hundred push-ups. This is what you get from watching 75 years' worth of war dramas. Ha ha ha, Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz said back at us. Don't think I don't know what you're thinking, you dumb shits. I know you're enjoying my performance at the moment. How delightful! I'm just like all those drill instructors you've seen in the movies. Aren't I just the fucking quaint one? The amused chuckles had come to a stop. That last bit was not in the script. You don't understand, Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz said. You're under the impression that I'm talking like this because this is just something drill instructors are supposed to do. You're under the impression that after a few weeks of training, my gruff but fair facade will begin to slip, and I will show some inkling of being impressed with the lot of you, and that at the end of your training you'll have earned my grudging respect. You're under the impression I'll think fondly of you while you're off making the universe safe for humanity, secure in the knowledge I've made you better fighting men and women. Your impression, ladies and gentlemen, is completely and irrevocably fucked. Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz stepped forward and paced down the line. Your impression is fucked, because unlike you, I have actually been out in the universe. I have seen what we're up against. I have seen men and women that I knew personally turned into hot fucking chunks of meat that could still manage to scream. On my first tour of duty, my commanding officer was turned into a goddamn alien lunch buffet. I watched as the fuckers grabbed him, pinned him to the ground, sliced out his internal organs, passed them out, and gobbled him down, and slid back under the ground before any of us could do a goddamn thing. A stifled giggle from somewhere behind me. Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz stopped and cocked his head. Oh, one of you thinks I'm kidding. One of you dumb motherfuckers always does. That's why I keep this around. Activate now, he said and suddenly in front of each of us a video screen appeared. It took me a disorienting second before I realized Ruiz had somehow managed to activate my brain pal remotely, switching on a video feed. The feed appeared to be taken from a small helmet camera. We saw several soldiers hunkered down in a foxhole discussing plans for the next day's travel. Then one of the soldiers stopped talking for a second and slammed a palm down onto the dirt. He glanced up fearfully and yelled, Incoming! a split second before the ground erupted beneath him. What happened next happened so quickly that not even the instinctive, panicked turn of the camera's owner was fast enough to miss it all. It was not pleasant. In the real world, someone was vomiting, ironically matching the action of the camera's owner. Blessedly, the video feed switched off right after that. I'm not so funny now, am I? Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz said mockingly. I'm not that happy fucking stereotypical drill instructor anymore, am I? You're not in a military comedy anymore, are you? Welcome to the fucking universe. The universe is a fucked up place, my friends. And I'm not talking to you like this because I'm putting on some amusing little drill instructor routine. That man who was sliced and diced was among the best fighting men I have ever had the privilege of knowing. None of you are his equal. And yet you see what happened to him. Think what will happen to you. I'm talking to you like this because I sincerely believe from the bottom of my heart that if you're the best humanity can do, we are magnificently and totally fucked. Do you believe me? Some of our number managed to mumble a yes sir or something close to it. The rest of us were still replaying the evisceration in our heads without the benefit of the brain pal. 
sir. Sir, I am a fucking master sergeant, you shitheads. I work for a living. You will answer with yes, master sergeant, when you need to answer in the affirmative, and no, master sergeant, when you answer in the negative. Do you understand? Yes, master sergeant, he replied. You can do better than that. Say it again. Yes, master sergeant, we screamed. Some of us were clearly on the verge of tears by the sound of that last bellow. For the next twelve weeks, my job is to attempt to train you to be soldiers, and by God, I am going to do it. I am going to do it despite the fact that I can already tell that none of you motherfuckers is up to the challenge. I want each of you to think about what I'm saying here. This isn't the old-time Earth military where drill sergeants had to tone up the fat, bulk up the weak, or educate the stupid. Each of you comes with a lifetime of experience in a new body that is in peak physical condition. You would think that would make my job easier. It does not. Each of you has 75 years of bad habits and personal feelings of entitlement that I have to purge in three goddamn months. And each of you thinks your new body is some kind of shiny new toy. Yeah, I know what you've been doing for the last week. You've been fucking like rabid monkeys. Guess what? Playtime is over. For the next 12 weeks, you'll be lucky if you have time to jerk off in the shower. Your shiny new toy is going to be put to work, my pretties, because I have to make you into soldiers, and that is going to be a full-time job. Ruiz resumed his pacing in front of the recruits. I want to make one thing clear. I do not like, nor will I ever like, any one of you. Why? Because I know that despite the fine work of myself and my staff, you will inevitably make all of us look bad. It pains me. It keeps me awake at night, knowing that no matter how much I teach you, you will inevitably fail those who fight with you. The best I can do is make sure that when you go, you don't take your whole fucking platoon down with you. That's right. If you only get yourself killed, I count that as a success. Now you may think that this is some sort of generalized hatred that I will carry for the lot of you. Let me assure you that this is not the case. Each of you will fail, but you will fail in your own unique way, and therefore I will dislike each of you on an individual basis. Why, even now, each of you has qualities that irritate the living fuck out of me. Do you believe me? Yes, Master Sergeant. Bullshit. Some of you are still thinking that I'm just going to hate the other guy. Ruiz shot out an arm and pointed out toward the plain and the rising sun. Use your pretty new eyes to focus on that transmission tower out there. You can just barely see it. It is ten clicks away, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to find something about each of you that will piss me off, and when I do, you will sprint to that fucking tower. If you are not back in an hour, this entire platoon will run it again tomorrow morning. Do you understand? Yes, Master Sergeant. I could see people trying to do the math in their heads. He was telling us to run five-minute miles all the way there and all the way back. I strongly suspected we'd be running it again tomorrow. Which of you was in the military back on Earth? Step up now, Ruiz asked. Seven recruits stepped forward. God damn it, Ruiz said. There is nothing I hate more in the entire fucking universe than a veteran recruit. We have to spend extra time and effort on you bastards, making you unlearn every single fucking thing you learned back home. All you sons of bitches had to do was fight humans, and even that you did badly. Oh yes, we saw that whole subcontinental war of yours. Shit. Six fucking years to beat an enemy that barely had firearms, and you had to cheat to win. Nukes are for pussies. Pussies. If the CDF fought like the U.S. forces fought, you know where humanity would be today? On an asteroid, scraping algae off the fucking tunnel walls. And which ones of you assholes are Marines? Two recruits stepped forward. You fuckers are the worst, Ruiz said, getting right in their faces. You smug bastards have killed more CDF soldiers than any alien species, doing things that Marine fucking way instead of the way they're supposed to be done. You probably had Semper Fi tattoos somewhere in your old body, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, Master Sergeant, they both replied. You are so fucking lucky they were left behind, because I swear I would have held you down and sliced them off myself. Oh, and you don't think I wouldn't? 
Well, unlike your precious fucking Marines or any other military branch down there, up here the drill instructor is God. I could turn your fucking intestines into a sausage pie, and all that would happen to me is they'd tell me to get one of the other recruits to mop up the mess. Ruiz stepped back to glare at all the veteran recruits. This is the real military, ladies and gentlemen. You're not in the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines now. You're one of us. And every time you forget it, I'm going to be there to step on your fucking head. Now start running. They ran. Who's homosexual? Ruiz said. Four recruits stepped forward, including Alan, who was standing next to me. I saw his eyebrows arch as he stepped up. Some of the finest soldiers in history were homosexual, Ruiz said. Alexander the Great, Richard the Lionhearted. The Spartans had a special platoon of soldiers who were gay lovers on the idea that a man would fight harder to protect his lover than he would for just another soldier. Some of the best fighters I ever knew personally were as queer as a three-dollar bill. Damn fine soldiers, all of them. But I will tell you the one thing that pisses me off about you all. You picked the wrong fucking moments to get confessional. Three separate times I've been fighting alongside a gay man when things have gone sour, and each fucking time he chooses that moment to tell me how he's always loved me. God damn, that's inappropriate. Some alien is trying to suck out my fucking brains, and my squad mate wants to talk about our relationship, as if I wasn't already busy. Do your squad mates a fucking favor. You got the hots? Deal with it on leave, not when some creature is trying to rip out your goddamn heart. Now run! Off they went. Who's a minority? Ten recruits stepped forward. Bullshit. Look around you, you assholes. Up here, everyone is green. There are no minorities. You want to be in a fucking minority? Fine. There are 20 billion humans in the universe. There are four trillion members of other sentient species. And they all want to turn you into a midday snack. And those are only the ones we know about. The first one of you who bitches about being a minority up here will get my green Latino foot squarely up your whiny ass. Move. They heaved out toward the plane. On it went. Ruiz had specific complaints against Christians, Jews, Muslims, and atheists. Government workers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, blue-collar Joes, pet owners, gun owners, practitioners of martial arts, wrestling fans, and... Weirdly, both for the fact that it bothered him and the fact that there was someone in the platoon who fit the category, clog dancers. In groups, pairs, and singly, recruits were peeled off and forced to run. Eventually, I became aware that Ruiz was looking directly at me. I remained at attention. I will be goddamned, Ruiz said. One of you shitheads is left. Yes, Master Sergeant, I yelled as loudly as I could. I find it somewhat difficult to believe that you do not fit into any of the categories I have railed against, Ruiz said. I suspect that you are attempting to avoid a pleasant morning jog. No, Master Sergeant, I bellowed. I simply refuse to acknowledge that there is not something about you I despise, Ruiz said. Where are you from? Ohio, Master Sergeant. Ruiz grimaced. Nothing there. Ohio's utter inoffensiveness had finally worked to my advantage. What did you do for a living, recruit? I was self-employed, Master Sergeant. As what? I was a writer, Master Sergeant. Ruiz's feral grin was back. Obviously, he had it in for those who worked with words. Tell me you wrote fiction, recruit, he said. I have a bone to pick with novelists. No, Master Sergeant. Christ, man, what did you write? I wrote advertising copy, Master Sergeant. Advertising? What sort of dumbass things did you advertise? My most famous advertising work involved Willy Wheelie, Master Sergeant. Willy Wheelie had been the mascot for Nirvana Tires, who made tires for specialty vehicles. I developed the basic idea and his tagline. The company's graphic artist took it from there. Willy Wheelie's arrival coincided with the revival of motorcycles. The fad lasted for several years, and Willie made a fair amount of money for Nirvana, both as an advertising mascot and through licensing for plush toys, t-shirts, shot glasses, and so on. A children's entertainment show was planned, but nothing came of it. It was a silly thing, 
but on the other hand, Willie's success meant I never ran out of clients. It worked out pretty well, until this very moment, it seemed. Ruiz suddenly lunged forward directly into my face and bellowed, You are the mastermind behind Willie Wheelie, recruit? Yes, Master Sergeant. There was a perverse pleasure in screaming at someone whose face was just millimeters away from your own. Ruiz hovered in my face for a few seconds, scanning it with his eyes, daring me to flinch. He actually snarled. Then he stepped back and began to unbutton his shirt. I remained at attention, but suddenly I was very, very scared. He whipped off his shirt, turned his right shoulder to me, and stepped forward again. Recruit, tell me what you see on my shoulder. I glanced down and thought, no fucking way. It is a tattoo of Willy Wheely, Master Sergeant. Goddamn right, snapped Ruiz. I'm going to tell you a story, recruit. Back on Earth, I was married to an evil, vicious woman, a veritable pit viper. Such was her hold on me that even though being married to her was a slow death by paper cuts, I still felt suicidal when she demanded a divorce. At my lowest moment, I stood at a bus stand, contemplating hurling myself in front of the next bus that came along. Then I looked over and saw an advertisement with Willy Wheely in it. And do you know what it said? Sometimes you just gotta hit the road, Master Sergeant. That tagline had taken me all of 15 seconds to write. What a world. Exactly, he said. And as I stared at that ad, I had what some would call a moment of clarity. I knew that what I needed was to just hit the fucking road. I divorced the evil slug of a wife, sang a song of thanks, packed my belongings into a saddlebag, and lit out. Ever since that blessed day, Willy Wheely has been my avatar, the symbol of my desire for personal freedom and expression. He saved my life, recruit, and I am forever grateful. You're welcome, Master Sergeant, I bellowed. Recruit, I am honored that I have had a chance to meet you. You were additionally the first recruit in the history of my tenure that I have not found immediate grounds to despise. I cannot tell you how much that disturbs and unnerves me. However, I bask in the almost certain knowledge that soon, possibly within the next few hours, you will undoubtedly do something to piss me off. To assure you that you do, in fact, I assign to you the role of platoon leader. It is a thankless fucking job that has no upside, since you have to ride these sad-ass recruits twice as hard as I do, because for every one of the numerous fuck-ups that they perform, you will also share the blame. They will hate you, despise you, plot your downfall, and I will be there to give you an extra ration of shit when they succeed. What do you think about that, recruit? Speak freely. It sounds like I'm pretty fucked, Master Sergeant, I yelled. That you are, recruit, Ruiz said. But you were fucked the moment you landed in my platoon. Now get running. Can't have the leader not run with his tune. Move. I don't know whether to congratulate you or be scared for you, Alan said to me as we headed toward the mess hall for breakfast. You can do both, I said. Although it probably makes more sense to be scared. I am. Ah, there they are. I pointed to a group of five recruits, three men, two women, who were milling about in front of the mess hall. Earlier in the day, as I was heading toward the communication tower on my run, my brain pal almost caused me to collide with a tree by flashing a text message directly into my field of view. I managed to swerve, merely clipping a shoulder, and told Asshole to switch to voice navigation before I got myself killed. Asshole complied and started the message over. Master Sergeant Antonio Ruiz's appointment of John Perry as leader of the 63rd Training Platoon has been processed. Congratulations on your advancement. You now have access to personnel files and brain pal information relating to recruits within the 63rd Training Platoon. Be aware that this information is for official use only. Access for non-military use is cause for immediate termination of platoon leader position and a court-martial trial at the base commander's discretion. Swell, I said, leaping a small gully. You will need to present Master Sergeant Ruiz with your selections for squad leaders by the end of your platoon's breakfast period, asshole continued. Would you like to review your platoon files to aid in your selection process? I would. I did. Asshole spewed out details at high speed on each recruit as I ran. 
By the time I made it to the comm tower, I had narrowed the list to 20 candidates. By the time I was nearing the base, I'd parceled out the entire platoon among squad leaders and sent mail to each of the five new squad leaders to meet me at the mess hall. That brain pal was certainly beginning to come in handy. I also noted that I managed to make it back to base in 55 minutes, and I hadn't passed any other recruits on the way back. I consulted Asshole and discovered that the slowest of the recruits, one of the former Marines, ironically, had clocked in at 58 minutes 13 seconds. We wouldn't be running to the comm tower tomorrow, or at least not because we were slow. I didn't doubt Sergeant Ruiz's ability to find another excuse, however. I was just hoping not to be the one to give it to him. The five recruits saw me and Alan coming and snapped more or less to attention. Three of them saluted immediately, followed somewhat sheepishly by the other two. I saluted back and smiled. Don't fret it, I said to the two who lagged. This is new to me, too. Come on, let's get in line and talk while we eat. Do you want me to light out? Alan asked me while we were in line. You've probably got a lot to cover with these guys. No, I said. I'd like you there. I want your opinion on these guys. Also, I have news for you. You're my second-in-command in our own squad. And since I've got a whole platoon to babysit, that means you're really going to be in charge of it. Hope you don't mind. I can handle it, Alan said, smiling. Thanks for putting me in your squad. Hey, I said. What's the point of being in charge if you can't indulge in pointless favoritism? Besides, when I go down, you'll be there to cushion my fall. That's me, Alan said, your military career airbag. The mess hall was packed, but the seven of us managed to commandeer a table. Introductions, I said. Let's know each other's names. I'm John Perry, and for the moment at least, I'm platoon leader. This is my squad second in command, Alan Rosenthal. Angela Merchant, said the woman immediately across from me of Trenton, New Jersey. Terry Duncan, said the fellow next to her, Missoula, Montana. Mark Jackson, St. Louis. Sarah O'Connell, Boston. Martin Garabedian, sunny Fresno, California. Well, aren't we geographically diverse, I said. That got a chuckle, which was good. I'll be quick about this, since if I spend any amount of time on this, it'll be clear that I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Basically, you five got chosen because there's something in your history that suggests that you'd be able to handle being a squad leader. I chose Angela because she was a CEO. Terry ran a cattle ranch. Mark was a colonel in the army, and with all respect to Sergeant Ruiz, I actually do think that's an advantage. That's nice to hear, Mark said. Martin was on the Fresno City Council, and Sarah here taught kindergarten for 30 years, which automatically makes her the most qualified of all of us. Another laugh. Man, I was on a roll. I'm going to be honest, I said. I'm not planning to be a hard ass on you. Sergeant Ruiz has got that job covered, and I'd just be a pale imitation. It's not my style. I don't know what your command style will be, but I want you to do what you need to do to keep on top of your recruits and to get them through the next three months. I don't really care about being platoon leader, but I think I care very much about making sure every recruit in this platoon has the skills and training they're going to need to survive out there. Ruiz's little home movie caught my attention, and I hope it got yours. Christ did it ever, Terry said. They dressed that poor bastard out like he was beef. I wish they had shown us that before we signed up, Angela said. I might have decided to stay old. It's war. Mark said. It's what happens. Let's just do what we can to make sure our guys make it through things like that, I said. Now, I've cut the platoon into six squads of ten. I'm top of A squad. Angela, you have B. Terry, C. Mark, D. Sarah, E. And Martin, F. I've given you permission to examine your recruit files with your brain pal. Choose your second in command and send me the details by lunch today. Between the two of you, keep discipline and training going smoothly. From my point of view, my whole reason for selecting you folks is so I don't have anything to do. Except run your own squad, Martin said. That's where I come in, Alan said. Let's meet every day at lunch, I said. We'll take other meals with our squads. 
If you have something that needs my attention, of course contact me immediately. But I do expect you to attempt to solve as many problems as you can by yourself. Like I said, I'm not planning on having a hard-ass style, but for better or worse, I am the platoon leader, so what I say goes. If I feel you're not measuring up, I'm going to let you know first. And then if that doesn't work, I'm going to replace you. It's not personal, it's making sure we all get the training we need to live out here. Everyone good with that? Nods all around. Excellent, I said and held up my tumbler. Then let's toast to the 63rd training platoon. Here's to making it through in one piece. We clunked our tumblers together and then got to eating and chatting. Things were looking up, I thought. It didn't take long to change that opinion. And that's the end of the chapter. So I think I'm going to stop there for now. Bye, my love. I hope you enjoyed this reading session, and I'll probably record the next one tomorrow or maybe later tonight. Bye, baby. I love you.